Uh, I'm going to be talking about using Rust for scientific programming. So I'm going to be talking about what makes Rust a good language to use for scientific computing, some interesting stuff we can do in Rust, and then finally some sort of areas we can improve on. So my name's Adam. If you want to follow me on Twitter or GitHub, my name's up there. So I want to start out with what scientific computing actually is. So when we talk about scientific computing, we're referring to the tools and techniques and algorithms that are needed to solve the problems that you come across in maths and engineering and in science. And you could sort of break this up into a few parts. So it's going to be things like numerical analysis and simulation. So that's going to be, oh, that's out of sync. Oh, sorry. So numerical analysis, a simulation, things like, oh, jeez. <laughs> Why is that? OK. So <laughs> things like simulating physical systems, doing sort of high performance computing on supercomputers, clusters, multi-threaded programming, and then data science. So that's like you know, statistical analysis, machine learning. So I'm really going to be more talking about the first two, because data analysis is a completely different sort of thing. So. If you look at how scientific software usually gets developed, it usually follows this sort of process. So it usually starts out with an implementation need or an idea. So that could be you have a new idea for an algorithm, you need to just run a calculation, or you have to re-implement something from a paper. And it usually goes from there. You might then go to a higher level language like Python, and then you'll probably implement something there. So Python is usually chosen first, or MATLAB, or any of the any of those sort of languages chosen first because, first of all, because it's easy. It's very easy to get started. Most of the people that do this sort of programming aren't computer scientists. They're physics students, math students, people who are just interested. And you probably wouldn't have that big much of a programming background. And higher level languages make it quite easy to get started. So you might write your prototype, and then you go, you see, oh, I can Im improve my algorithm a little bit. And you go back, you write a little bit more. And then you might realize that, oh, there's this really big part that's bottlenecking all my code. I need to then go and rewrite that in a lower level language. And that usually boils down to rewriting it in C and C++. And it's usually for like two reasons. It's usually one, because of just tradition, because well, science doesn't move quite as quickly as programming does. And well, C++ is used a lot already. And so you might just use that already. And there's also tools for it, ecosystems, libraries there already. So it usually goes into writing that sort of thing. And then after that, it could be benchmarking, publishing a paper, or just publishing the software, whatever. But it's mainly that step there, the rewriting step, is where Rust could come in. So let's see if I can change this slide. So there is a few problems with just going and well, rewriting a big section of your code in C++, especially if you don't have that much experience. Oh, that skipped again. Why? Not a good day for slides. Uh, there you go. So first of all, it's harder to debug this sort of code. So if you don't have a lot of experience, it's a very easy to do a sort of guess and check approach to programming. So you write a little bit, and then you might you know, open up a REPL, see if it works, and you might create a new file and just try and run it. So it's not the sort of things that you might normally do, where you might write tests or any of that sort of thing. And that's a lot harder to do when you use a language like C or something that you have to compile, because it's not as quick. You can't just iterate as fast. And it's also going to be harder to learn. So if you pick up a language like Python, it's very easy to just you know, open a text editor and put in stuff. You don't really need that much background knowledge. Whereas if you're writing in a lower level language, you have to know a little bit more about well, memory and how things actually work and referencing things. And you've got to sort of have a fairly good idea, especially if you're trying to well, get well-performing code. And that ties into the next bit, which is it's very easy to write bad code. So it's very easy to write code that's not going to be memory safe. It's going to have all sorts of issues that you wouldn't come across in languages like MATLAB, which is like race conditions. Like You might not know that this sort of thing could even be an issue. So it's very easy to do that. So it's this sort of place where Rust can actually help out. So let's see. So for example, if we want to do something like testing, so here is a function. It just does a factorial. So if I was writing this in Python and I just wanted to see if it would work, I'd probably just go, I'd open up the Python interpreter, and I'd just type in a few things and see if it matches up. Whereas it's not usually that easy to do, especially if you have to keep trying to do that. Whereas a language like Rust, you can just well add a test, because it's built into the language. So 
It's those sort of things that become really, really easy. And also for the writing better code, Rust has a lot of sort of like guarantees, but also a lot of features that make it a lot easier. So here's a piece of code, but this might not be the best way to write this out. So tools like Clippy and the linters will sort of say, oh, well, you can actually see where you're trying to iterate through that. Well, that's actually an iterable, so you can go and you can rewrite this a little bit differently, and that will improve your code in the long run. So it's, there's loads of features in Rust that could help. There's, well, things like the memory and thread safety, so that's not something you have to learn or think about. Things like the built-in benchmarking, built-in documentation, built-in dependencies, all things that are hard enough to get set up in languages like C and C++, especially if you don't have that much experience. And then things like, well, there's a lot of good libraries in Rust. There's integration, like great FFI support, and then also other features like WebAssembly. So I'm going to look a little bit more specifically. So let's look at multi-threading. So if I want to do some sort of algorithm, here is well numerical integration, well, a very simplified version. But basically, we're just sort of trying to calculate the area under a function. But it mainly comes down to a loop there where we're just summing things up. So this is exactly the type of thing that you might come across and you might want to parallelize. And tools in Rust can make that really easy. For example, we can just take the rayon crate, we put it in our cargo.toml, and then we just import it. And we don't have to think about, well, trying to find the libraries and trying to add compiler flags and fixing our make files. or you can just go and then you can just rewrite your function and it works pretty well, it's pretty readable, and you don't have that much extra complexity that comes with it. And then there's also other stuff like we can, well, there's obviously like built-in threading libraries. We can integrate with other C libraries such as OpenCL. We can do things like integrating with ArrayFire or like linear algebra systems, and then sort of real specific stuff like Crossbeam. So, Another thing is, as I said, integration with other tools. So in the scientific community, there are a lot of very well-implemented pre-existing tools. And there's no real point in rewriting things from the ground up when they've already been well, optimized really, really heavily. So for example, let's say I want to run some code in parallel on a supercomputer or a cluster or a group of machines. The usual way you do that is with MPI, message passing interface. And this is basically just a C specification for well, pretty much a library. But every computer that runs this would probably have a different version, and they're pretty heavily optimized for the hardware. So it's not going to be something you want to rewrite, but it is something you can still use through Rust. So here's what I would have to write in C. So it's you know, taken straight out of a, an example. But I can go in Rust. I can just import a library. And then I can well run it, write it in Rust, and it runs perfectly well. And it's the same for a lot of other C libraries. There's a lot of binding crates that are already there. It's really easy to create new ones with tools like well, BindGen. And there's also things like WebAssembly, which will allow us to do stuff on the web. So there's a lot of other interesting features as well. I mentioned WebAssembly. So let's say I have a piece of code. So I'm going to run something here. This is a, oh no. You know what? I don't it's fine. <laughs> anyway, so it's a, it's a simulation of a double pendulum. You might have seen it. But you can sort of break it up into two parts. There was the simulation part, which is written in Rust. And then there's also supposed to be a graphics part, but I clearly made a mistake somewhere. But they're separate. So I don't have that. It's not that to closely coupled. So it means I can go, I can just take that Rust code. And I can take it there. I can compile it to WebAssembly. And then I can, well, run it in the web with the browser. And then we can get, ooh, skip something. We can get something that we can actually run. So hopefully this will actually work. There. So that's what it's supposed to look like. And that's in the browser. So it's the same code that I could run on my computer really quickly. And I can run in the browser as well. And that has a lot of applications, especially in places where you might want to share your code. You might want to share a simulation and you still don't lose that much speed. So if you've ever done any sort of scientific programming, you've probably seen Jupyter Notebooks. It's a way where you can, in your browser, connect to well, the, a terminal in your computer, and you can run code, and you can see the output. And it's something that's very, very useful for doing a lot of programming in this sort of environment. So there's been a lot of efforts in Rust. I think I've seen at least three crates. But 
a lot of them get sort of discontinued like oh well there was this certain change in Rust 1.16 and now we can't use it unless you're on the nightly compiler from that exact day or they just don't get maintained but there's a project that came out not that long ago under the Google organization and it's e e e v c x or and it allows us that we can do Jupyter notebooks using Rust so for example here it is we're doing Fibonacci numbers computing them and while it doesn't work perfectly, like it doesn't run on Mac, it doesn't run on Windows, you can't kill it halfway through or it won't run, but it's the type of thing that is being developed in Rust that you will be able to use, hopefully, at some point. So, and that gives other things like a REPL, which means you can do those sort of quicker evaluations of if your things work, and also, well, stuff you can bring into your own code. So, Rust seems like a really pretty good option for doing this sort of programming, but it has a lot of issues as well. The main reason why you wouldn't pick Rust to do this sort of thing would probably be the ecosystem. It's something that you probably look at very closely when you're trying to choose your language and you probably just want to use the tools that are available already. And while it is nice that we have a lot of sort of bindings, crates and stuff, it, a lot of the time it's just more convenient to take someone else's code they wrote in C and then just you know put in your other bits and then you don't actually even have to write it from scratch and you're not thinking about your make files because your advisor already did it for you. So it's those sort of things that really aren't the best for uh, someone new coming into Rust when you're like, okay, there's a lot of libraries which don't really have every feature or they have the core, but that specific thing you need to do just isn't implemented yet, and that can be a real barrier to entry. As well as sometimes there's this perception that Rust is just for systems programming or that it's a difficult language, which isn't really the case, but that can be a little bit of a barrier as well. So I think that's all I have time for. So thank you. And if anyone has any questions. Any questions? So what's your opinion on sort of breaching the gap between performance and readability with languages which sort of aim for both and for a, more, for a syntax more similar to math, like Julia? And do you think there's a future there in like the Rust community, generally speaking, building tools that bind to Julia code similar to how you have, let's say, the NumPy stuff or like the stuff put on top of it that's a lot of C++ code and essentially helping make um, um, scientific computing fast in Python. Yeah, so you're asking, is there a place in Rust for to do? Is there like a future sort of Julia Rust collaboration which you see as being very fruitful because both of the languages are young yeah. and Julia essentially aims at more speed and readability in the scientific computing community, more or less? Yeah, so Julia is a language that sort of it's sort of set out with the implement with the idea that you could not sacrifice either, so you get sort of a Python low-level, fast-running code hybrid. But uh, Ju uh, Julia has those same FFI features that Rust has, so you can import the code as you would normally with any other language into Julia. And I, I'm not sure if there are any specific crates for doing the sort of both ways, the same way you can do with crates like PyO3 for Python or Neon for Node, but it's definitely something you could do, and there's obviously a place for that sort of thing. I haven't really done that much with Julia, but I know it's definitely possible to integrate Rust code with it. All right, more questions? Yeah. Uh, why don't cho you don't choose a uh, Fortran for a um, multi-level uh, parallelizer on the CPU and GPU? Because Fortran uh, have a speed up uh, in this case. So why, why, don't, why don't you use Fortran? Yeah. Yeah. Well, surprisingly... In the supercomputing, in the, um, the better. Yeah, well, so Fortran is sort of weird. You don't really see it that much anywhere apart from in science. There's a lot of really big libraries that are written in Fortran. There's 
the real problem is why some someone wouldn't pick up for trying to write something new would be there's it's not really modern there's not really a lot of resources for learning it and as i said before most of the people that are going into this sort of computing wouldn't have done that much computer science they might have done one class or two classes in school to like learn this sort of thing and usually fortran isn't chosen that much it is chosen but it's not chosen that much and it's especially hard to sort of get started with because there's not the same resources and community that would be even with languages like C and C++. So. Okay, thank you. Any other? We have time for one more question. Okay, then it's done. Thank you very much, Adam. Thank you.